Maybe. We're going to be talking about Christ, the cornerstone. Here's where we are in our Easter readings from the book of Acts. It's the day after Peter and John healed a man who had been crippled since birth. This man, who had never walked a day in his life, has now danced and leaped around Solomon's porch, praising God. People came running to see what was happening, and Peter, now filled with the Holy Spirit, preached his second sermon. The first one had been on Pentecost. 3,000 people believed and were baptized in the name of Jesus. This time, though, even more people are moved to repentance, and they join the believers. The church is growing, and it isn't, hasn't even called itself a church yet. But it's making the priest and the temple rulers very nervous. The temple officials sent Peter and John to jail for the night. They think a night on a cold stone floor might cool down their hot heads. It will also give them time to gather the high priest and all the other leaders to figure out what to do with these followers of Jesus who keep on claiming what was truly impossible. But the temple officials haven't considered how the power of the Holy Spirit can change simple, uneducated fishermen into eloquent witnesses to the resurrection. They still haven't figured out that this movement isn't the result of any human effort or design. It's the work of God through his son, Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. How does something so good cause so much trouble? You would think that bringing health to someone who'd been sick his entire life would be the cause for everyone's rejoicing. The crippled beggar certainly saw it that way. He immediately got up, took a few steps, and started leaping and praising God loudly. He had made eye contact with Peter and John, hoping for a few coins, but instead he had experienced a life-changing event. He was whole and well for the first time in his life. He had a new identity, and certainly he had a new perspective. He had never seen the world from a standing position. His point of view had always been way down on the ground. But now he could walk and leap and dance for joy. Who else but God could make this possible? Who else but this Jesus that Peter and John were talking about could heal him this way? His joy was infectious, spreading to others nearby who had seen the miracle with their own eyes, and their joy and amazement quickly attracted many more people, and more people kept coming until there was a crowd running to find out what all the commotion was about. And this is where the trouble starts. If the healed man had just minded his own business, instead of dancing and whooping it up all over the place, things would have been fine. People may or may not have noticed that he wasn't there the next day where he'd always been sitting, begging by the beautiful gate, asking for a handout. People may or may not have seen him getting a job and working for a living instead of begging. People may or may not have connected his new status to God's work in his life and in the world. But no, this man has been transformed and not just his ankles. He's been changed forever by the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. And he simply will not be silent about it. So a crowd gathers and the temple rulers have good reason to be concerned. They know that the Romans do not ignore crowds of 5,000 agitated Jews. Peter and John have not only threatened the peace of Jerusalem with their healing and their preaching, they've also endangered the Pax Romana, the peace guaranteed by Rome, the peace that Rome will enforce with a vengeance. Why should a work of charity create such a stir and get Peter and John thrown into jail overnight? What is the problem exactly? In a word, power. Notice how the question moved rapidly from what's going on here to where did you get the power to do this or who authorized you to say and do these things. This amazing healing might have started out as an occasion to rejoice in God's mercy, but the priests and rulers don't see it that way. They see this event as a direct attack on their authority, a challenge to their positions of power. 
It doesn't help that these leaders have already started to worry about the rapid growth of this new faith community. In just a few weeks, it's grown from 12 disciples to about 120 believers, then to 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, and now 5,000 more have heard the word and believed. That's a significant growth spurt, and the temple leaders might well have seen it as a threat. Rapid growth often means instability, and that feels scary to the leaders whose power depends on maintaining the status quo. Now, as Thomas Long puts it, a bunch of uneducated and ordinary men have been filled with divine power to instruct people in positions of power about the true source of power. And this points up another problem that the temple rulers had with power. Part of their job it was to protect the people from the full, unmediated glare of God's great glory. The power of God was so evident in Peter and John that it was frightening to those who had never experienced it in such a rare form. By Old Testament standards, they should have been afraid for their lives, having seen God's power so fully displayed. If power is the problem, Peter has the solution, and it's the one every child in Sunday school knows the answer is always Jesus. At Pentecost and again in Solomon's porch, Peter has confessed the crucified Christ as the source of healing and salvation. Now he reframes the high priest's question to focus on a good deed, an act of insurrection as the power, the source of power that comes only from God and only through his son, Jesus Christ. Peter points a finger at the rulers as the ones responsible for Jesus' crucifixion, and he's aware, even then, that three other fingers are pointing back at him. When he speaks of the stone you, the builders, had rejected, he remembers his own denial of Jesus. It puts him in the same category as these priests. And keep in mind that this event takes place in just a few short weeks after Jesus has stood on this same pavement before these same religious rulers. And Peter is quoting the very same verse from Psalm 118 that Jesus used. Trust me, this is no accident. It was on Tuesday of Holy Week when Jesus spoke about the cornerstone, referring to both Psalm 118 and Isaiah 28. According to Matthew's gospel, Jesus had just driven out the money changers the day before and was teaching in the temple courts. Using parables, he challenged the religious systems of the day, summing up the parable of the wicked tenants with the quote from Psalm 118 that describes a rejected stone becoming the cornerstone. The people who heard Jesus that day would have been very familiar with Psalm 118. It was a psalm traditionally sung as the Passover lamb was being slaughtered. It also would be sung at the beginning of the meal on the first night of Passover. When Jesus mentioned the stone the builders rejected, his listeners would have heard it in the context of Passover, even though they did not know he was referring to himself as the cornerstone then. What would cause a stonemason to reject a particular stone for a cornerstone? What attributes does a stone need to have in order to become the cornerstone? What is a cornerstone, anyway? Well, the cornerstone is the first so stone that's set in the construction of a masonry foundation. All the other foundation stones are set in reference to this first stone which means the cornerstone determines the position of the entire structure. For the building to be sound, all the foundation stones must line up perfectly with the cornerstone as their reference point. The other stones may be of various shapes and sizes, but because of its function as a reference point, the cornerstone needs to be of fairly good size and relatively square on the ends. It needs to be a solid chunk of good quality rock without any defects. The whole building is going to rest on this stone or be lined up with it. So most stones will be rejected for one reason or another. Here's something you may find interesting. In both Aramaic and Hebrew, the word for stone sounds almost like the word for sun. So this wordplay would have been clear to the high priest and to the Jewish leaders. Jesus had identified the builder who rejects the stone 
with the temple rulers. And that shocking comparison would have still been in their memory as the same rulers heard Peter preach about God's son, the stone that was rejected, Jesus Christ, the new cornerstone. While Jesus might have implied the connection within the context of a parable, Peter is quite clear in his accusation. Instead of saying the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, Peter makes it personal. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone, he said. The parable Jesus told and the sermon Peter preaches both ask the same question. How will we respond to the grace God offers through Jesus Christ? Will we align ourselves with the cornerstone or will we reject the Son of God? Staying in line with Jesus keeps us in line with God and his purposes for our lives. God has laid the cornerstone in Jesus, but the foundation and the building of the kingdom of God was, must be made up of other stones, a lot of other stones, what Peter will lay call, later call living stones, meaning us. He says in 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6, Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house, to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So we are those living stones, especially when we're arranged in perfect alignment with our cornerstone, Jesus Christ. But how do we do that exactly? How do we stay in line with Christ? Of course, we can always fall back on the answers of reading the Bible regularly and praying without ceasing. We can talk about maintaining fellowship with one another, and those answers are all good, and those activities are certainly part of staying aligned with Christ. But even more, I think, it requires intentionality on our part. We must desire to be in line with God's will and give Christ the primary central place in our lives. Remember, the cornerstone is not an ornament. It isn't an add-on or an interesting architectural detail. It is the very foundation. If Christ is to be our cornerstone, he has to be the central focus of our faith and of our lives. God sent his own son, who has been rejected by many. God will always seek those who are willing to live in right relationship with him. That relationship depends on our relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. If we align ourselves with Christ, the cornerstone, we will be in right relation with God, the Father. And if we don't align ourselves with Christ, we will stand in opposition to him. The choice is always ours. Jesus died for the whole world, to save the whole world. No other human power, not temple, law, or government, can be depended upon for your salvation. Jesus is the authority which un under the entire world is brought into alignment with God's will. But there's something interesting about the power we find in Christ the Cornerstone. Barbara Brown Taylor writes, as important as this particular cornerstone is, it is curiously passive. After the builders rejected it, it did not leap into places under its own power, but someone placed it there at the corner. What does this say about the power vested in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth? Is it the muscular power of someone who makes things happen? Or the power of one willing to lie wherever God places him, trusting that God will use him well? Peter trusts that he does not stand in the dock alone. He is filled with the Holy Spirit. While the verb is passive, Peter is passive in the same way the cornerstone is passive. The rock is willing to be wherever God places him, trusting that God will use him well. So I have to ask, are you willing to be where God places you? 
trusting that God will use you well? Have you aligned yourself with Christ as your cornerstone and made him the center of your life? There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we may be saved. Thanks be to God who sent us his Son. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, open our hearts to your power moving around us and between us and within us until your glory is revealed in our love of both friend and enemy, in communities transformed by justice and compassion, and in the healing of all and everyone that is broken. Amen. Go now in the sure knowledge that you were created by God the Father, redeemed by Jesus Christ his Son, and empowered for your ministry of doing your part in building the kingdom of God. You are a living stone. Amen. Amen.